Jaipur Literature Festival at Mahindra Humanities Center Darbar Hall. We are delighted to introduce our sesh first session for the day, Heirs to Forgotten Kingdoms, Gerard Roussel in conversation with William. But then Hello, today, yeah. okay. we're going to take over. Thank Can you. we give a big round of applause to our speaker, Fadi? William would be here shortly. Till then, you can take over. Very good. I, I, shall, um, I shall have to do both parts uh, for the beginning of this talk uh, and then eventually just be myself towards the end. Um, I, uh, what is it that ISIS wants to destroy? We are familiar with the destruction of architectural monuments, as you see here, the destruction of Palmyra. And we know that they have killed, driven out many, not only of non-Muslim faiths, Christians, driven out, Yazidis slaughtered, women raped, but also, of course, Shia and Sunni Muslims as well. And yet, I want to suggest something else that they want to destroy that's not just about the killing of people or the destruction of things, but about the suppression of memory, about changing the narrative of history so that a particular way of seeing it, a particular set of events can be forgotten, and in their place there is another interpretation. Because, of course, it's entirely possible to look back to the Arab conquests of the 7th century AD, a phenomenal occurrence, as you see here from this map, in which, in just a few short years, Arab tribes motivated by Islam came out of the Arabian Peninsula and conquered not only the Byzantine Empire, but also, or large parts of it, but also the Persian Empire, which was an astonishing occurrence. And it's very easy to look at that and to say that is the most amazing thing, the proof of God's support, if you like. But in truth, um, conquests of this kind, though very exceptional and remarkable, were not completely unique because Alexander the Great, uh, the Romans, later the Mongols, of course, other nations, European nations too, have achieved similar conquests. What was much more remarkable was that those areas were held under Muslim Arab rule for many centuries afterwards. And the truth about that is that it was not about the force of arms, but about the willingness of those Arab conquerors to work with the ideas and the cultures of the people that they ruled. So that in fact you see very quickly, after the defeat of the Persians, the Arabs want to learn how did the Persians rule. They want to adopt Persian ideas of kingship and the relationship with religion. So that incidentally, some of the rules in early in Islamic practice about the relationship with other religions are actually adopted from and based on Persian principles. And this Persian empire, just to give you a sense of it, at its very height, stretched across an enormous landmass. If we're talking the sixth century BC, you begin to see from it, this I suppose at its you know, highest point really, a little later in time. You begin to see how it stretches from India in the east to the Mediterranean. And in that space, they had to reconcile an enormous number of different cultures for you know, nearly over a thousand years. Cultures of the east, cultures of the west, it was a place where for the first time in human history you had uh, Indian religions, because we have a specific reference to the existence of Hinduism and Buddhism in the Persian Empire in around the third century AD. And you have Judaism and ultimately Christianity from the West. And in that great landmass, that great uh, area of relative stability, you could have encounters between ways of thought and life that had previously never encountered each other. And so in that Persian tradition, there had been an acceptance of how to help religions to live with one another, and occasional persecutions happened. We know that the Hindus and Buddhists were in that empire because there is a, an inscription recording, allegedly, the suppression of all of these alien faiths 
uh, along with uh, Judaism and Christianity. And so we know that they jostled alongside each other, that they were there, that there were conversions from one to another, and that there was an acceptance of the principle of tolerance. And that, to some extent, filtered through into those early Arab kingdoms, along with Byzantine architecture and the religious ideas of the old pre-Islamic civilizations. Now, when looking at the map of Persia and thinking about the way that actually India and Europe encountered each other in that space, and I guess Europe is irrelevant, really. It's Europe, it's uh, India and the Mediterranean. It's India and the Semitic religions. It's um, interesting to note that there was, in Lebanon, the, se the secular leader of the Druze movement, of the Druze people, Kamal Jumblat, who was a uh, very, very in interesting man, a sort of feudal landlord, but also a socialist. And he used to come to India very often. He would study here uh, at the feet of a yogi because he believed that his faith, which is a variant of Islam, is usually understood, he saw it as actually being a branch of Indian civilization. And in fact, when I was in Lebanon, I was in Lebanon to meet his son. And I was told that there was a community there from India visiting to celebrate this Druze connection with India. This is probably a bit of an exaggeration because uh, what you see with the Druze, what you see with several of these faiths in the Middle East, are characteristics that you might think of as being characteristic of India, such as a belief in reincarnation. But if you look back in history, you will see that these were very common beliefs in the Middle East, before Islam, before Christianity. It was also common to believe that the divine spirit could appear in human form, and that people over the course of history had taken on the mantle of divinity. And this is important because you'll find it in a lot of these Middle Eastern religions that are today so much on the verge of being forgotten or of even becoming extinct. And some of these faiths go back a very long time indeed. Because if you can imagine a space in which you've got Greek and Jewish and Babylonian and Persian and Indian ideas all meeting each other, you can see that with some of these faiths, with some of these peoples, there is a preservation of very, very old ideas indeed. Mesopotamia, of course, was one of the oldest cultures in human history and Cities existed in what we now call Iraq, uh, 5,000 BC, so we have uh, almost as long before the Great Pyramids of Egypt as we are from those pyramids. And we have peoples emerging from it and surviving not only because of this uh, concept of a degree of tolerance, which existed under particularly the early Arab Muslim rulers, but also because of the remarkable topography of certain places in Iraq, these are the Iraqi marshes, where for uh, 1,800 years, the Mandaeans lived, survived, practiced a very ancient, very reclusive faith, one where the priesthood know the secrets of the faith, but the average Mandaean, the average follower of this religion, will not know very much at all about what its doctrines are. And indeed, to become a priest, it's a considerable effort because you have to be willing to go through the ritual of staying awake uh, for seven days and seven nights, uh, eating nothing. And the community will come and very helpfully gather around the tent in which this ceremony will happen. And they'll bang drums and shout and ululate in order to make sure that the would-be priest cannot sleep. And this is a great festival, of course, for the people. I often wondered how the priest feels, but it's... Um, they have to sit inside the tent learning words that are written for them in the dust with a stick by an actual initiated priest. And those words are words of power in the Mandayan tradition which are never taught to others, just as the true name of any Mandayan is never told to others because it could be used against them magically. Uh, and so when you meet them, they will have often a, a use name, as it were, a name for society, but it's not actually the name they're given at their baptism. Baptism being one of their, one of their uh, principal rituals. And they have a great reverence for John the Baptist, so that when Christians encountered the Mandans, Portuguese Christians in the 16th century, 
They imagined that the Mandaeans were a species of Christians. They had encountered uh, the St. Thomas Christians in India, and they thought these were St. John Christians, since they had a reverence for John the Baptist, and they practiced baptism. And the Mandaeans had no difficulty about attending church and doing many things that were apparently Christian, but they would always insist upon being buried separately. And after, t actually it took a very long time for the missionaries to realize that this was because, far from being Christians, they had their own very separate religion. And in fact, if you look inside the text, the sacred texts, which are secret, but which uh, were discovered by and sold to British researchers in the 19th century and 20th century, you will see that, in fact, the narrative of the Mandayan is very hostile to Jesus, very hostile also to Judaism, because it emerged at a time when those faiths were competing with each other. And in fact, the closest parallel we have to the Mandayans uh, in ancient times, in documented ancient times, because the Mandaeans may have existed, we don't know how long. There's no, almost no, ref there's no reference to them in outside history until about 1000 AD, but they are much older than that. So in order to sort of work out what parallels there are to them, people have looked back to the Manichees. Back in around the third century AD, there was a great movement towards asceticism. In what had been a place, Mesopotamia and Persia, places of, uh, some indulgence when it came to religion, the sacrifice of animals. And the great Persian tradition, I don't know whether you've come across this tradition, that uh, in order to make a decision, as Herodotus tells us, the Persians would first try the, an idea out when they were drunk, and then when they were sober, or if they'd had the idea when they were sober, they would then test it again when they were drunk and see whether they still felt that it was a good idea. And this you know, sounds silly, sounds ridiculous, but of course, in the Zoroastrian tradition, which the Persians had, wine was regarded as a, as a, a, a means of attaining a form of divine ecstasy, a form of uh, access to divine wisdom. So we have, at that time, uh, a man called Patik goes to a temple and he is offering a sacrifice, except that he has a vision, a vision of a, uh, of a, a voice telling him to abandon the eating of meat, the giving of sacrifices, abandon sex, uh, and go and live uh, with his wife and his pregnant wife, go and live in the marshes. The marshes, as we recall, being this incredible network of islands where people could live in great isolation from the outside world. And he meets there, astonishing as it may seem, there's a great community of people already there who are likewise giving up meat and sex and the drinking of wine. And uh, strange as it may seem, because the religion seems to have an in intrinsic kind of contradiction, because if you are encouraging people not to have sex, then they won't have any children. But the religion spreads vastly, so much that it became in ne necessary in China, in medieval China, to suppress it, because it was so popular. And the great secret of it was that only uh, a, an elite of about 10% of the religion would need to practice asceticism of that kind. The asceticism was so much that Mani would actually demand that, uh, sorry, Mani being the son of Patik, that's how that's crucial, right? Mani who comes into this community of ascetics and who says, your uh, practices are insufficient. You must go further. The community already had a respect for water, but he said it isn't enough to wash in water is to contaminate it, you must wash in urine. He says, uh, you eat fruit from trees, thinking that it is more virtuous than eating meat, but actually even the fruit is a crime. The fig tree weeps for the fruit that is plucked from its branches. And so an elaborate system of, of atonement was set up for the, even for the eating of fruit. And yet this religion spreads across, across the world to the point where there is even a temple now in China, a Buddhist temple, ostensibly, that the statue of it, of Buddha, has been determined to be that of Mani. So old, so old that it has been forgotten who it was of originally. And the Mandaeans likewise were in the marshes at the same time, practicing very similar ascetic rigor, although they were, they were allowed to, to have sex and have children, which probably helped them to, to survive, I suspect, as the Manichaeans did not. And I had in the book the desire to kind of root when I was writing about these faiths, because 
When I lived in Baghdad 2005 to 6, and I discovered the Mandalas, I did feel a great urge to know more. I didn't know then that I would write about them. I just really wanted to understand who are they, where did they come from, how long have they been there? Their language is Babylonian Aramaic. Did they have a connection to ancient Babylon? And so I eventually, uh, I had a friend who, Nadia, who's in this picture, who is on the right there with a slightly mischievous smile, who um, is preparing for her first battle. And eventually decided to tell the story of the Mandalas through her life, her life in Baghdad, her life up till 2003, and subsequently, of course, uh, exile, a persecution and exile, or at least we could say terror and exile. And with her, very sadly, this, this community, which numbered tens of thousands in Iraq in the 1980s and 90s, uh, has begun to diminish to the point where it is 90% of those who were there in Iraq in 2003 have left. The numbers are reaching an unsustainable point at which there will not be enough priests to minister to the people. And yet, as I look back, I try to find, you know, is there this link to ancient Babylon? And there is. In the form of the magic that is practiced by Mandaeans to this day, Saddam Hussein used to go for spells to the Mandaean high priest. Because it's still regarded, they're still regarded because of their connections to these ancient cultures as having special access to, to magical abilities. And uh, in these spells, you will see the survival of the names of ancient gods from Mesopotamia, Bel, Libat, uh, Nabu. Gods that haven't been worshipped, so far as we know, for a very, very long time. And yet many things survived very, very unexpectedly. These men are Yazidis from northern Iraq. They're in their second place of exile, having been driven out from Sinjar, where, as you'll recall, Islamic State came, slaughtered many of the men, uh, took the women as slaves. And these people fled from there, reached a refugee camp, were driven out of that refugee camp again as Islamic State moved northeast, and came to the eastern side of the Mosul Dam, where you see them now. And in the front is a sheikh of the Yazidis. Now, the Yazidis are even more mysterious than the Mandans, even more extraordinary. Uh, because their faith appears to have complexities, elements in it that are just not there with the Mandans. Sometimes people ask whether these are monotheistic faiths. And it's a very complicated question. They would all say that they are. And yet they also allow for entities that are between earth and heaven. So for the Mandans, the sun and the moon and the stars are powerful entities, some of them to be worshipped, some to be feared. And there are numbers of other entities as well in their, in their uh, if you like, their, their demonology and their angelology. There's actually a wonderful uh, demon in the Mandayan version of hell who is called Dina Nuk, who is half man, half book. Uh, probably appropriate for the Jaipur Literary Festival, I suspect. Um, and uh, sits by the waters reading or something, which I thought was a wonderful concept. Um, but the, the Yazidis have uh, a character in their concept of the divine who, who is very unique and very controversial because they do not, if you ever meet a Yazidi, a good piece of advice is not to use the word Satan. They don't like it. In fact, a letter sent by the head of the Yazidis, the temporal leader of the Yazidis, in about 1890 to the Ottoman authorities explaining why the Yazidis shouldn't serve in the Ottoman army says, the thing is that we know that you Muslims like to curse shaitan, Satan. Uh, and if we hear the name shaitan, it is obligatory for us first to kill the person who has said it, uh, and then to kill ourselves for having heard it. And uh, on these grounds, rather than inconvenience yourself by not uh, needing to curse Satan, in our presence we suggest that you go conscript us, which is a very good idea, very good try. Actually, it did work. Um, uh, and although I didn't test this particular proposition myself, I, um, I used the word Iblis, which is a sort of synonym for the character who rebelled against God in the tradition of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, who rebelled against God and was cast down, having been prince of all the angels, became leader, as it were, of the rebels, and ultimately king of hell. And yet, in the Yazidi tradition, repented and was restored to heaven. 
and is once more Lord of this world and Prince of the angels and the subject of the reverence of theism. In their tradition, this figure, Iblis, takes the form of peacock. And you will often find, if you go to their homes, peacock feathers, other emblems of the peacock. And it's for this reason, it's really in part because they are an obviously non-Islamic faith. At times, they have elements of Islam in their culture. Sufi saints, uh, certain Islamic characteristics, certain words that are Arabic, Arab origins. Sometimes they, they clearly have some Arab origins. And even the name Yazidi, some regard it as being possibly Islamic in origin, but they are regarded by their neighbors very, um, I mean, traditionally Christians and Muslims with, with a great deal of hostility. Uh, and this belief in Iblis obviously uh, is very controversial. And so there have been numerous slaughters and massacres of the Yazidis over the years. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, they were reduced to a quarter of their number by a massacre. And this uh, lady uh, was one of those, again, of those victims, of those refugees who fled Sinjar, fleeing 25 miles on foot, carrying her babies, of whom, as you can see, two survived. And here is what they call the Sanjak. It may be, it looks a little familiar in an Indian context. It's, um, it is, however, in their tradition, one of seven sacred bronze Sanjaks that are carried around the community, and they represent the figure whom they call, not Iblis generally, but they will call him Malak Ta'us, the peacock angel. Because, as I say, he takes the form of a peacock. And again, there is that sort of tantalizing possibility of some link with, with India, because many people would say, well, why the peacock? Interestingly, for the Druze, the peacock and not the serpent was the tempter in the Garden of Eden. And so there is some tradition around the peacock as a symbol, a symbol of evil, or if you're a Yazidi, a symbol of good. But if we're talking about uh, connections with India, and I couldn't resist slipping in a reference to the Kalasha when I was coming up with the concept of this book, um, Willie rightly told me that the Kalasha really didn't fit uh, because they uh, were not part of that, as I showed you, that earlier meeting of ideas, meeting of religions and themes that helped to create the Mandaeans and the Yazidis, and also, by the way, had a huge influence on Christianity and Islam. Instead of being part of the great swirl and meeting of civilizations, the Kalasha are a people who have really been left behind by it, living in the very high mountains of Chitral, and who preserved their, what most analysts think is a sort of version, an early version, a precursor, if you like, of Hinduism. Uh, there are many gods to whom they sacrifice goats, uh, include Imra, who is seen as a version of Yama, and Gish, a god of war. And here they are celebrating the festival of Jestak, uh, goddess of the family, with dancing right in the sort of context of Pakistan, right on in the very midst, by the way, of one of the most uh, radical and dangerous areas of Afghanistan, just across the peaks from what is called Nuristan. Nuristan was once the country or the place where this religion was practiced most. And in the 1890s, uh, King Abdurrahman of Afghanistan came and suppressed forever this last remnant of uh, non-Islamic religion in Afghanistan. But it does survive still in Pakistan. And so I want to use that to really point up, in a sense, a, a moral, because I found these religions really wonderful to, to study and to learn about. And I felt I was also learning something of, certainly, of my culture's history, because they've played a part in the development of the history of Western religions. And as I say, there is this connection also to the religions of India. But I also felt that I was learning about the history of Islam, since all of these religions have in common that they now exist in the context of Islam. And I don't wish to whitewash history. It is actually a very complex and difficult interaction between religions. No monotheism is truly tolerant, because anybody who believes that they have the truth is going to try and communicate it. And if you are the state and people don't practice your religion traditionally, always there would be some question of loyalty. And whenever that came into play, the state would attempt to enforce its own religion on the people. 
So it would not be right to, to make out that it is uh, a simple and clean history of uh, tolerance for hundreds of years. It's not quite like that. But there were many glimpses of possibilities of uh, an interaction between religions that would be positive and constructive. For example, in that Persian Empire that we saw, bordering India, but also close to China, even after the Islamic conquests, even living under a Muslim Khalifa, was one of the greatest Christian churches in earth. One that had, from a base near Baghdad, missionaries and monasteries as far east as Beijing. It covered an astonishing land mass. It was from there, by the way, that Christianity was brought to China. And that continued, continued to be one of the greatest Christian churches in the world for hundreds of years after the Islamic conquest and under the rule of the Muslim Caliphate. And its destruction came, by the way, not so much at the hands, not at the hands of Arabs, certainly, but with a mixture of the Mongol invasions and then the coming of Tamerlane, which drove it out of its traditional heartland right up into northern Iraq. And finally, of course, in recent months, it's been driven out of northern Iraq into refugee camps scattered around the Kurdistan region. But if we look back in time, we see figures like uh, Thabit ibn Qurra, who lived under Islamic rule again in the ninth century and who was a pagan. And absolutely clear, he was clear about it. He wrote an ode in praise of paganism. He said, where would you have been if it wasn't for paganism? You know, the world would have been destitute if it hadn't been for the religion and the culture of people like me. So he, instead of being massacred or slaughtered or executed, was allowed to go and become uh, a teacher of geometry in Baghdad. For him, by the way, geometry would have had a sacred significance. Because one of the wonderful links that draws these religions together, that draws the peoples together, has been uh, shared ideas. For example, Greek philosophy. If you go to meet the Druze in Lebanon and you talk to the Druze elders, the people, by the way, again, in the same system as the Mandaeans and the Yazidis will not know anything about the faith. So if you are a Druze, you will uh, be entirely ignorant of the principles of the faith, except you'll know about reincarnation. It's very popular. But you will not know the holy books, and you will not know very much about what the actual theory is behind the Druze faith. But if you meet the Druze elders and talk to them, you will discover that they know a lot about Greek philosophy. And if you're looking for a religion in the world today that comes closest to the vision of God that the Greeks of the 5th century BC would have had, it's the Druze, because they have kept it in a very pure form. A form in, in which, by the way, the, the early Muslim Arabs were also very interested until it, in the sort of later centuries, became unfashionable. And so that Greek philosophy links the Druze, links those early Muslims, links many elements of Islam today with Christianity, which also based itself on Greek philosophy. Judaism was also influenced by it. And if we look back in time, the Greeks were influenced in turn by the Zoroastrians of Iran. And so we have these marvelous connections between peoples and religions, which, had it not been for these minority faiths, being a last remnant, really, of an earlier culture, would be much easier to forget, much easier to lose sight of. Even that idea of the divine becoming incarnate or becoming present on the earth is an idea that links the ancient past with the present. The Druze still have that belief, so do the Yazidis. And so it seems to me that it was said when the origins of Indo-European were being explored, when people were discovering that there was a connection between Sanskrit, between Sanskrit and Farsi, between Farsi and English and Latin and Greek and German. It was said, blessed are they who through patient researches uncover the veils that separate mankind from each other. And I believe that in holding up the memory of these faiths, of these religions, we can help to remember something that binds mankind together at a time when people are so desirous of developing narratives that set us against each other, not only in the present, but also throughout past time. 
Really, when I began, I thought I would, um, well, I didn't really take your part. I couldn't presume, but I, I must say that I want to pay tribute to your book from the Holy Mountain, which was a great inspiration. When I went to Jerusalem in 1998, uh, as a very young diplomat, uh, I, I was, people drew my attention to, from the Holy Mountain. There's a large Armenian community in Jerusalem because they loved it. And, um, and I read that book, and I thought, oh, what a wonderful book. Uh, and so it was a terrific thing to have, you know, to write a book that anyone could compare in the least way to yours, and to be inspired by it, to, to write my own. In part, I was also very fortunate, really, in an, in an ironic way, uh, to be able to spend time in Iraq. Because Iraq was the place where these faiths stayed alive for longest, I think, largely because of topography, not necessarily because of could be something in the Iraqi character, that's a very complex question. But certainly something about the lawlessness that has prevailed in many bits of Iraq in the north and the south, which meant that these faiths could survive there in very remote places. Uh, but most of all, really, I want to pay a tribute to these, to these faiths. It was an endless joy to learn more about them and to meet the practitioners and to be able to tell their stories, particularly those of Iraqis who in the last 10 years have had so much suffering and of these religions which seem now to be on the very verge of extinction and to be able to keep them alive to some measure through this book and other books and the memory of those other books but also I hope by encouraging these practitioners of these faiths to uh, understand their own faiths better and keep them alive. It's now the case that many of these faiths are best represented in Europe and Australia and America and that if you go to Detroit is where you will find some of the largest contingents of those Iraqi Christians who keep alive the tradition of that faith which went to China in the seventh century. And so in a peculiar way, some of the travel for this book had to be to America and had to be to, to bits of Europe. And there'll be an opportunity, I think we're talking about travel at 12,000 as well. So William, may I hand over to you if you would like to come. I would encourage all of you to go and um, read this book. You can see what an extraordinary speaker he is, this wonderful perioration without notes for 30 minutes, but also equally beautiful writer. And there is an extraordinary craft and art with the way that he has woven together in this fantastic book, um, which we should wave up and um, so you can all see the cover and recognize it in the bookshop. Um, the, his own travels, and his own observations with the extraordinary research he's done into the theology, philosophy, anthropology. But I mean, in a sense, for many of these, you, you've got them just in time. I mean, so many of them presumably are, are simply not there anymore, particularly the Yezidis. I mean, ha, do you know what happened to the people you interviewed so movingly in your book? Are there now any of them enslaved now in Raqqa? Well, uh, for many of them, all of them, uh, I understand it, are the great difficulty they face, the great difficulty the, the Yazidis face is that they are exiled from their homeland. It's very hard for them to return. They do try and go back. It's very dangerous. They were scattered. They were scattered, and we heard in this room yesterday about the Armenian genocide. The Yazidis were also caught up in that same persecution, and they had gradually already been dispossessed under the Ottoman Empire, so that large numbers of them migrated to Armenia, Villages, their villages in Turkey, in what's now Turkey, were largely destroyed. Some of them fled to Syria. They claim that they have some in Iraq, I don't know. And so they already had the immense problem of being scattered across a great area. And their spiritual center was at a place called Lalish, which is in northern Iraq. Is um, that currently under ISIS? It's not, it's, it's under Kurdish rule. But this is still very difficult for many Yazidis to access. And for many of them, if they can't go there, and the Sanjak, which was traditionally the focus of worship, is, is not there in Armenia, what you have is a community that is sort of dispossessed of its access to its priestly past and to its actual resources. When I was dealing with the Kalasha, and I was asking them about Kuvok, which is, of course, 
uh, over those centuries, the reason that these religions now are so tiny is that they have traditionally, you know, the conversion has been accomplished by conversion to Islam. And it isn't uh, very often the case that people have been forced at the point of death to be converted. It does happen, it has happened. It is more common that over time, people having no intellectual resource to defend their own faith have converted because they are confronted with a wealth of intellectual resource in their own time. And so for some of these faiths, because it's been traditionally secretized, the average lay person knows nothing of what the teaching of their religion is and cannot defend it in argument. That is often an embarrassment for them. And particularly, therefore, with the Yazidis, but with others as well, to be dispossessed of the access to your spiritual faith is, is a terrible blow. But there are figures, aren't there, for the number who are enslaved, 10,000 or? Uh, more than that, I believe. The figures are really hard to pin down because they're, they're, people are never precise. Um, so the Yazidis will say that they number a million overall world, worldwide. But most experts say it's half a million at most. Uh, I, I think that there are probably thousands of women still held in slavery in Iraq. It's, and they were obviously killed, we don't know why. Did you see this, there was a story in the article in The Guardian a couple of weeks ago about uh, um, a, a Sunni family in Raqqa who had heard this Yazidi girl crying next door and they actually bought her from her slave owner and then managed to get in touch with her family uh, and they brought her through the right of land through uh, the Turkish border where they handed them over to the Yazidis. But in desperate fear of marriage, they had to leave the Middle East for five, two years of just enslavement. Yeah, it is, I mean, it's wonderful to have you know, those sort of touching stories that remind us that it is in fact the fringe, you know, the Nazi fringe that they lived. One of the things that always intrigues me is, that, is how a different century of Islam has shown so many different faces to these minorities. In, in the West, we like to preach at Islam as intolerant and bigoted, and, but we of course wiped out every single one of our pagan minorities. There are no um, Celts um, worshipping springs in, in northern Scotland or um, Thor worshippers in Norway, and not even any Muslims in Granada. Um, there was a tolerance about Islam that did allow these people to pay their jizya uh, and continue under Islamic rule. And yet, it seems that the, from the late 19th century with the arrival of nationalism uh, and, and ideas of, uh, of the people with the Bulgarians and the, the Balkans beginning to slip out of Ottoman control, you get a, a hardening that has continued to now ISIS in, in a kind of direct line of growing intolerance in the Islamic world every year. Why is that? Why, why is that happening? Do you have an answer? Well, it's a it's a great and profound question. Uh, I I think um, that there are two things to say. One that I think that I suppose I would relatively defend nationalism because if we're to look for a period when these religions flourished most in modern times, in the last thousand years, we would find it at the time when we, we could be an Iraqi <coughs> and a Mandan. So Iraqi nationalism for all its problems, did give a potential for people of any religion to become as patriotic and as full of citizen as their neighbor. Tariq Aziz, wasn't it? Yes. Tariq Aziz, Saddam's uh, foreign minister at the t just before the second Gulf War, uh, was an, uh, an, uh, an Arab, uh, he was a Syrian Christian. He was, he was. And apparently once surprised, um, uh, I don't know whether it was um, what's it called, Halliburton, um, the book? Cheney published uh, uh, by singing Onward Christian Soldiers in Aramaic when they first met. <laughs> Cheney hadn't expected. No, I, I expect he hadn't. Um, the, the great, there's, a great, there's a great story of a, the, a Mandayan. You know, I mentioned the Mandayans have this reverence for the, for the stars and the sun and the moon. And of course, this led a very intellectual Mandayan in the 20th century to study uh, cosmology and astronomy. And he went to study with Albert Einstein. And he came back to Iraq. It's a true story. It's a true story. Yeah. And he came back to Iraq with a, with a pen that had been given him by, by Einstein. Um, and he became president of one of the universities of Baghdad because this was in the 50s. This was, a relative, this was probably the peak of uh, tolerance, if you like, openness to religion. And when the Ba'ath came to power, they regarded him as a communist, which he may have been, and they uh, seized the pen and broke it. And this was the one time uh, in the persecution visited on him and by the Ba'ath party that he broke down and cried. Um, but this is an example both of the sort of terrible things that have happened in Iraq, not 
just since Kuban has been here for a much longer time. And also, though, the potential that it had and how much society benefited by exploiting that potential. You've had generations now of very talented people of different faiths and indeed within Islam of different branches of Islam who've all contributed immensely to the knowledge of the society. And when you look back and you look at the early Arab society, for all its problems, I mean, it was a, a culture of its time. 1,400 years ago, it was not by contemporary standards tolerable. But the fact that they were able to have, to invite to Baghdad, a man who'd written and owned in plays of paganism, says something for me that... Or equally in, in sitting in, in um, Cordoba, in Umayyad Cordoba, getting um, Jewish... Christian and Islamic scholars to work on Greek, ancient Greek text, translating into Arabic, and, and, and all these scholars, multi-faith project to retrieve the, the, uh, the, the learning of antiquity and, and convert it into Arabic. Extraordinary. But in, in Indian Islamic history too, you have these great swings from Dar al Shuko and Akbar welcoming all faiths to just three generations later, the Aurangzeb, um, massive persecutions and destruction of temples. And, and you see these very different sides of the faith. And, and it's been true in, in Christianity. So you have, in the early uh, centuries, really, of Christianity, uh, even after Constantine was emperor, and it, paganism was still taught uh, until, until Justinian comes and he says, enough of that, we're going to close down the schools of philosophy. And so you've had figures who were motivated by whatever cause to wish to impose their religion and their beliefs on others thinking that without it there can be no loyalty to the state. And one of the things I think that the Middle East greatly needs is a narrative that explains how you can be loyal to the state while being of whatever religion. And that narrative, at times you've seen it almost become victorious, but in recent years it has really sunk down. The popular imagination does not seem to accept this as much. One uh, faith you didn't talk much about, the, the Zoroastrians. Obviously here in India we have a, a large Parsi community. Um, would you talk about the situation about how many, yet, how many Zoroastrians left still practicing in Iran? There's a, um, an ambiguity about the numbers of Zoroastrians in Iran because some Baha'i uh, are worse persecuted than the Zoroastrians and so have labeled themselves as Zoroastrians. Many Baha'i, some Baha'i families in Iran are of Zoroastrian origin quite recently. They converted in the 19th century and so it's relatively easy for them to go back. Uh, so the f official figure, I think, is, is 20,000, but there is a, a controversy around how many there actually are. And do you know how many there are in, in, in India? There's supposedly 70,000. So, so the, the, yeah. the great ba base of Zoroastrianism is now Bombay. It is. And I mean, yeah. up, this is a real change because up till the Middle Ages, it was, you know, people used to send from Bombay, used to ask for instruction from the clergy in Iran, which was still the heart of the religion. Until relatively recently. In Yazd, or where was it? Where was the center of? Uh, gosh, you've got me there. I think it was Yazd, um, although there were many uh, different centers. So traditionally, I mean, Yazd has remained because it's so isolated, has remained the center of Zoroastrianism. Although as recently as the 19th century, there were Zoroastrians in Shiraz, there were many more communities, and it's actually contracted enormously in in the last half a century, I would say. And do you still meet in Bombay today um, Parsis who, who can tell? Stories of, of, of families trekking as recently as, as grandfathers walking from Iran to Gujarat. Yes, to Iran. Yeah. 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 Uh, and there's developed a difference, by the way, when you meet the Iranian Zoroastrians, this is, when it, the, there was a conference on Zoroastrianism in, the, in, the, in London about two years ago, and it was rather fabulous to see the great debates happening very openly dis about theology and about practice. The Iranian Zoroastrians see themselves as more liberal. Um, but perhaps that's not wise for me to get drawn into this, but I... Um, it was just intriguing to me to see that there's um, the faiths have evolved in slightly different ways, slightly different practices in the different in these two different. There's countries. a great uh, dispute within the Zoroastrian community here on on rules for who is a Zoroastrian, and the, at the moment the conservatives seem to have got the, the whip hand, and, and if you marry out your children or not. One, uh, one, one thing that the Iranian Zoroastrians do, which is really unusual and very interesting, and I. There were some things that I, I didn't wish to include in the book because the, you know, I thought they were too dangerous, uh, in particular the issue of conversion up front, which is uh, an absolute taboo. And yet, interestingly, the Zoroastrians have put on the internet uh, footage of the conversion of Iranian Muslims to Zoroastrianism. I, I should say that when um, I, went, I just recently returned from Yazd and, and was following in, in Jared's footsteps and went to the 
the fire temples in Yazd. And the kind person you, you liaised me with was in the, in the business of converting in London some, some British Muslims back to Gayatri. Not back to Gayatri, Gayatri. Yeah. But they often see it as a return. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the wonderful thing about Zoroastrianism, for those who, who read uh, C.S. Lewis, I don't, I don't know, is he read in India very much? Yeah. Narnia. Uh, is that he, he's, of, it's quite clear if you read the Narnia books that C.S. Lewis based the books on his understanding of Zoroastrianism because the beginning of the Shahnama, which is the great epic of Iran, which is a very Zoroastrian tale, is a battle of this traditional belief that the animals uh, have chosen either to be with evil or with good, and each animal can be seen in that context of being either an animal of good, like a dog, or an animal of evil, and um, like a cat. Or the ant. Uh, or the ant. Mm. Um, and in the, in the uh, Avesta, there is actually a, a, a line which talks about the appropriate uh, uh, thing that you should do if you kill an otter, which is seen as a form of God and is therefore both holy and very good, you must atone for it by killing 10,000 cats. <laughs> uh, so it is, um, C.S. Lewis, in choosing a lion to be the sort of emblem of good in Narnia, is absolutely breaking the Zoroastrian tradition. But, but the, otters, the otters are good in, in the, Narnia, the too. The otters are good, and he had this concept of the good animals and the bad animals. This is inspired by Zoroastrianism, as he himself admitted in his book. Another faith that you, that you talk fascinatingly about, that haven't talked about in, in the lecture, is the Copts. Yes, and um, I uh, lived in Egypt for a year. It was my first encounter, actually, with, with the other religions of the Middle East. And, you know, the, the great attraction, I suppose, of Copts. I, I, um, for me, it was a great attraction because the Copts provided a sort of bridge because I could go to church being a Christian and it was at the same time as being in some senses a community of mine. It was also very Aryan because all of the people spoke Arabic and I'd read them so much of their narratives in Coptic. And, and yet you could actually feel here's a bridge into what can seem quite a harsh society to go to. Just to go in that, so you, you go to church in one of these monasteries in Egypt and you hear still spoken at the service the language of the pharaohs still living on, extraordinary thought. Uh, the only rival to Sanskrit is the kind of oldest living um, uh, language of faith. And there's actually a revival movement. There's a family who, who um, there's a group of sort of quite uh, enthusiastic um, Coptic, uh, actually priests, um, uh, who uh, have revived Coptic as a spoken language. And I was told it was a monk in southern Egypt. I went traveling in 2012 and uh, wanted to sort of go to the monasteries and meet the people and talk about how they felt, particularly in the aftermath of all the events in Egypt. But when I was talking to this monk in a remote monastery in the desert in southern Egypt, he complained to me about this Coptic bishop who'd come and had this project of reviving Coptic as a spoken language and insisted on giving his lecture in Coptic and people asked him what he was doing. The monk <laughs> complained that this was really very difficult um, because they knew it was a liturgical language. They didn't really know how to write. I, I found when I was in the Coptic monasteries this extraordinary dichotomy between the, the almost sort of childlike faith and belief in miracles and, and the fact that they were also almost all um, technicians. That they, they, they'd all been uh, often abroad to study biology or en engineering and many of them were um, very advanced desert farmers uh, with advanced um, degrees in irrigation and, and this sort of thing. And yet they talked about you know holy fathers appearing between the towers of the church only last week and now some of them, you know, have, have you seen this? He said, no, no, I'm short-sighted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, have, they have Christianity in a very undiluted form. They're very proud of it. Yeah. And actually, a lot in parallel with the Islamic revival in Egypt, there's been a Christian revival. Very, very similar, actually, because what you're seeing is the burgeoning middle class coming up from very traditional rural origins and now becoming very skilled, very educated but possessing still a very strongly conservative sense of religion. And m many, I mean, a huge influence on Egypt because many of them, of course, are Muslims and it's contributed to an Islamization of society. But the Coptic Church, perhaps in reaction to some extent, has also been greatly strengthened. Um, and huge reformed. revival of the monasteries uh, and, often, and often rather dodgy restorations of the sort we were talking about yesterday with these ancient monasteries suddenly getting new concrete wings popping up everywhere for um, the, the busloads of, of urban cops who come out of the monasteries on the weekends. And that kind of conceals a little bit the fact that the Coptic community is diminishing, like all of these other religious communities, is diminishing in number, not in the same uh, 
not at the same rate, much more slowly, but nonetheless, we see far more Coptic churches now in Europe and America, and that's a sign of a trend of emigration. And Australia, big Coptic scene boom. Um, in Kerala, there's, there's the, the amazing echoes of all these folks from the two rival Nestorian metropolitans and archbishops in one town, Trishore, and there's one of them called Mara Pram, um, who has the only, I think, uh, some form of Aramaic that has died out everywhere else. And he has the only printing press in the world that's still printed. And he's run out of holy text, so he now just quote, prints joke books uh, in Aramaic. And he modeled himself on Kushwant Singh and decided that he has to do 25 volumes of Aramaic jokes uh, now. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> incredible. <laughs> I, I, um, I'd love to get those joke books. I, I, should, um, I have some, actually. Oh, excellent. Uh, I, I, um, I was very intrigued, by the way, talking of, of Kerala and just thinking of Goa. The Portuguese took uh, a group of Mandaeans off to Goa in the 16th century, who presumably have descendants still living there today, probably unaware of what their ancestry was. There was this great moment in history, extraordinary moment, when um, Kublai Khan's wife or mother was an Assyrian king. And the, the, the great Khans could have gone down that route. They, and, and the whole point of Marco Polo's journey was being sent by, out by the Pope to see whether these Mongols could be converted to Christianity. And instead they converted to Islam and, and Chamberlain happened and, and these things were wiped out. But with a, just a slightly different shape of the dice, um, the great Mongol hordes could have turned Christian and, the, and you could have had an Nestorian Christian empire stretching throughout China. Extraordinary period. And the Nestorians themselves thought that might happen. I mean, they were somewhat panicked, I think, by the arrival of, of the Mongols, as everyone was, but less panicked than Muslims because, because they had allies, because there had been these conversion efforts by Iraqi Christianity, Iraqi Iranians. Gen Genghis Khan's mother was Christian. His, his uh, I thought it was not his mother. And Kublai it, Khan's wife. Like I think it was his mother-in-law or his, uh, his wife. And that would explain his mother-in-law. That would explain the ferocity. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, um, but they, they appointed for the only time in Christianity's history a patriarch who was from East Asia, who was probably Mongol. He was either Mongol or Chinese, who uh, took the wonderful name of Yad al-Laha. Um, and he was a patriarch because they realized that they needed somebody who could speak for the Mongol leaders. So this man had actually, by coincidence, he'd come on a huge pilgrimage from essentially from Beijing. And he'd walked from Beijing across to Baghdad. He'd come on pilgrimage to the center of the faith, as you see it, which is near Baghdad. And, and the other extraordinary thing in, in the book is that I hadn't noticed that there, was, there, was arch, there were cathedrals, archbishops in Kashgar and Lhasa before there was one in Canterbury. This is what the antiquity of this whole thing. Uh, we, we think of Christianity as being a, a Western religion. In the Middle Ages, they used the formulation of Christendom as a synonym for Europe. But uh, we were very late in the day in, in this piece. I think um, I'd like to give you a big, a loud, large round of applause for Gerald Ruffin, <laughs> extraordinary research. have time for a couple of questions, uh, very briefly, sir, here. Hello. Uh, hello, sir. So I have read your book, very good book. Uh, my, I have two quick questions. Uh, first, you have talked about the Copts. Uh, would it be better to talk about the Maronites also, because they are also a declining trade in that means? And also, like, talking about the Druze, like, uh, what is the reason that they are treated in a very, like, very well manner in Israel because they are a part of the army also, but you see in Lebanon they are being discriminated. So do they have a kind of a nationalist feeling like to shift to Israel or something? Thank you. Thank you. Well, the, the Druze have been, it's been a very turbulent time uh, in the Middle East. There have been so many changes. One of the things that traditionally, if you were a minority community, you would want to do is to, generally speaking, get on side with the rulers of the community of the country and do what you can to stay on their side. In a time of perpetual revolution, it becomes very hard to do that. The Druze have um, therefore been uh, very successful in Israel. They've lost a lot of their land, I have to say. It's not, a, not entirely a positive story. So the Israeli state has confiscated quite a lot of their land in order to really to uh, build a Jewish town there. But 
they have gained status, they've been treated, they're not persecuted for their faith at all, of course, um, and they're very loyal and very often serve in the army and also in the border police. And they're often used as intelligence agents because they speak better Arabic um, to be used against the Palestinians in the West Bank. And so I hate to say the Palestinians. And so there's been a, a wedge driving effort, which has been very successful, but, um, but they certainly, if you talk to them, they, uh, views may differ, um, but I think where they would be most worried about is the situation in Syria, because they have there in Syria are confronted with very, very difficult choices whose side do you take? And if you look at some of the videos of Al-Qaeda, and not so much ISIS actually, of Al-Qaeda uh, executing captives, uh, many, you, you will see videos of Druids being executed because they are seen as apostates, they're seen as Muslim heretics, and therefore as worse than Christians and Jews. Um, in Lebanon, they've been led very cleverly by, by the Libyan bloc. The Maronites of Lebanon are diminishing greatly as a political force, and they have emigrated. They've emigrated since the 19th century. 5% of Latin America is made up of Arab Christian emigrants uh, and their descendants who went from Palestine and Lebanon largely. Many of the great Brazilian footballers. Yes. Um, uh, and actresses and, you know, the richest man in the world <laughs> and all this. Uh, uh, fascinating to see what they've managed to, to achieve. Um, but they haven't, you know, Lebanon itself I is really being, uh, they're planning to leave with a, with a return. They, of course, really, in a sense, I mean, the Maronites is a terribly controversial issue because they would tend to say, they, they wish generally to say that they're Phoenician by origin and non-Arab. Some would say that they're the original descendants of the Arab Christians. Um, this lady, and next to that lady, if you like. Thank you. Uh, your book sounds fascinating. I must go and get a copy right away. Uh, but I wonder, you know, uh, uh, the, the situation of the Yazidi and the Islamic State, uh, but the fact that thousands of Yazidi women have been picked up uh, and treated as sex slaves, few of them have managed to escape, but most of them are still held. Is it a deliberate attempt? Uh, would, you, would you see it as a deliberate exercise to sort of reduce the population of the Z Yazidis, to wipe them out completely? I mean, uh, what, what would your take be on that? Well, it, 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 is, a, it, it is not as unique an occurrence as one might like to think. The Ottomans did the same thing in the 1890s and the same thing in the 1840s, uh, and um, it, it's, it's, it's what Abdurrahman Khan in Afghanistan did to the, uh, the, 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 if you like, the Kafirs or the Kalash or whatever you choose to call them in, in Nuristan. And so uh, there is a precedent for that. It, it is aimed, as William says, to bring about conversion. It's also very helpful in terms of displacing the Yazidis that their land is strategic. It sits just north of Mosul, and it's probable that the, uh, ISIS is looking for propaganda victories. That was a great propaganda victory. It distracted attention from the fact that they'd lost battles elsewhere. Um, it, it enables them to pose as being the most militant of all Muslims. And, and this is always what they seek to do, is to push it beyond what anybody else would do, and reviving slavery is precisely that kind of statement. And frankly, for the kind of rather thuggish person who wants to go and join them, the idea of having slaves is quite an attractive one. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, I also feel grateful for learning about Down from the Mountain as a, as a follow-up book. Um, but I was wondering if each of you might be able to recommend sort of three or five books as background reading on this topic, because you guys seem to be have a, a quite a wealth of knowledge here. Um, so after I go and get your book and read it, um, what would you recommend as further course of study or even prerequisites? Are there uh, even more broadly on theology or anthropology, but, but specifically on these topics? Well, there's a, I mean, Willie's book is, I think, a wonderful exposition, uh, focusing on Christianity, but looking at many of the same themes. I don't deal with the Yezidis um, or the Mandians, but uh, it's a different form of Christianity from the Mandians. But there are, there are very good specialist books on Mandians, um, attempts to link them with the Gnostics, and, uh, and there's a great fat book called The Mandians. There's a very good book on the Yezidis, um, the, the, the individual studies. What's remarkable, I think, about Jared's book is that uh, he's, he's knitted this all together into a single picture of this, this once plural tapestry, which is now being unraveled, all the threads are being pulled apart. Uh, uh, and uh, 
it, it's a very nicely done study. It's a wonderful book. I think uh, we ha don't have time for any more questions, so please, one more big round of applause for Jared Russell. That was our first session for the day at the Mahindra Humanities Center Darbar Hall. We'd like to